This is the Insights for ArcGIS session, the advanced part. So uh, the introductions, we had three introductory sessions through the week. I hope you were able to catch at least one of them. This is the second advanced session, and unfortunately for us, this is our bad luck room. There's always <laughs> something wrong, always something wrong. The first advanced session, the internet died. Literally, we were hardwired in. Couldn't connect to the Wi-Fi. And it's kind of hard to show a web-based anything without Wi-Fi or mm -hmm. internet. Second time, these screens died. Yeah. Right. We couldn't see anything. Third time's a charm. Hopefully nothing goes wrong. So yeah. we'll see. Yes? Yeah. Yay. I'm optimistic. I'm sure you are. So let's get into it. When we first started thinking about the workshop topics, we wanted to really hit the mark with what our existing users wanted as well as what potential users wanted or just people that are interested. So we started thinking through some of these topics. Before I get into those, really quick, how many folks are using Insights today? Okay, a few hands. Oh, well, you don't count. Oh. She Why uses not? it every day. <laughs> um, cool. How many folks are thinking about using it? Cool. I like that. All right. So we are a brand new product. We're six months old. Uh, we released it in December. So here we are. We're going to be talking about version 2.0, and we'll talk about the roadmap and how we got to 2.0 quickly in, uh, towards the end of the workshop. But let's get on to it. First topic is, we want to hear about insights, but the only time I can spend, uh, this is one of the questions, believe it or not, the only time I can come is this session. So if you haven't seen the intro session, I apologize. There's literally one slide on introduction. So hopefully we'll be okay there. All right. It's easy. It's so easy to use insights. Yeah, so it's it. easy. You don't need there an introductory go. session. Okay, good. I'm, I'm happy about that. Saw this last year. Can you keep me impressed? Yes. <laughs> sure, we can. <laughs> we hope so. Um, that's why we changed up the uh, order of what we're doing in this advanced session. We're not going to be doing too many slides, just enough. But the majority of it is an actual analysis workflow. So we'll actually talk through that in just a minute. I know enough about GIS and spatial analysis that I don't yet need yet another intro. That's good because this is the advanced course. We're good there. So we're going to focus on only advanced topics, get down and dirty. And last but not least, been there, done that, what's behind the magic curtain? Well, we are going to talk about how this thing works behind the scenes. It's not a traditional ArcGIS client that's very heavy on JavaScript and just calls a bunch of REST endpoints. It's more than that. You'll see that in just a little bit. So let's hit the intro slide first. This is the only intro part that you're going to get. For those of you who don't know about Insights, we introduced this back in December at version 1.0 as part of the 10.5 release. Since then, we've released four times, not because it was bad, but because we continue to increase quality, more, add more features, functions, add more performance, in a, in a very agile way. Every couple of months we delivered something, every um, eight to 10 weeks. What we wanted to be able to do with Insights is deliver a very visual and intuitive way of experiencing analysis. Spatial analysis is inclusive of data analysis. It's not separate, it's not different. It's about analysis. Just wanted to point that out. Queries, filters, aggregations, and joins, whether it's based on an attribute or based on a spatial thing, it's all the same. You're doing analysis. The difference is spatial is special. And the science of geographic information through the technology of GIS, the system of geographic information, is what we're working with to expose a very visual and intuitive way of discovering true analysis with um, your data. And that's the important part. It's your data that you're analyzing. And sometimes it's spatial, sometimes it's not. We can work with all the above, straight out of the box. We want to be able to not only show you a quick visualization of the data, we wanted you to experience an analysis and then put the visualization on a given card, which changes the concept of what a card is. It's not a mere visualization. It's not just a chart. It's not just a map. It's not just a table. It's meant to take your analysis further. And we hope that the analysis will, that we do through a demonstration here will show that case. Ultimately. Analysis is a lot of things. 80% of it is data wrangling. How many folks know about data wrangling? 
If you've been doing any kind of analysis, do. you've been doing data wrangling. <laughs> They're just being polite. <laughs> yeah, data cleaning, data prep, figuring out how to get your data to a place where I can start asking you questions. That's what we call data wrangling. A lot of, a lot of, inside of uh, insights is built to take your raw data and do as much with it as it can without you having to do a lot of data wrangling. So a lot of the convenience in working with your data has been built in. We've got a long way to go because there's so much involved, but it does take those things into account and adds convenience in working with that data so you can get quicker, faster along with your analysis. But of course, every analysis, how many folks take out a piece of paper and pencil when they're doing analysis, writing down notes as they go, remembering where they go? For me, it's sticky notes. The bigger my monitor, the more sticky notes there are, right? Insights also records everything that you do. So as you begin to understand your data, which is the majority of every analysis, you need to understand your data. You're exploring, you're iterating, you're trying to figure out what it's saying to you, what kind of questions you can ask of it. It's recording everything along the way. So if you get to an aha moment and you stumbled upon it, that's okay, because everything that you did is recorded in this model. Literally, it's a model that you can then um, use for documentation purposes, how you achieve the results. But more importantly, a model as a template so you can repeat the, the analysis without having to recreate it every single time. That's all automated. The third aspect of the model is it's literally what is driving the page. It's the code behind the page that you're working on. So that if I mess up, I make a mistake, that's okay. It's intuitive, which means it's friendly which means I can quickly undo and redo without paying a cost. So the entire experience itself is predicated upon performance. Very linked, very responsive information so that you can get all the information out of it as possible within one set of analysis. Um, that's a quick top level introduction. What we really want to do, since this is the advanced session, we wanted to actually perform a proper analysis. This is an actual analysis that Linda had performed using ArcGIS Desktop just four years ago with this same data set. It's wildlife strikes and airline operations using APHIS data. Um, I, I yep, that's it, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. Thank give you, I knew I was gonna out. mess that one up, but we'll give those guys a shout out. Real analysis, real questions. Now in ArcGIS Desktop, we had to create um, about a dozen or so Python scripts, a couple of three different models, mm -hmm. and lots of time to generate all this. We're going to repeat that exact analysis without any scripting, without any model builder, <laughs> just using insights. <laughs> yeah, you better be scared. Cause... So in the we process, we're going to break down the analysis by page and actually walk through the different parts of insights that we're highlighting during each page. So ready? Here we go. Let's go. All right. So I'm going to start up a workbook. Let me find my mouse. And the first thing you've already seen, how you can bring in data from multiple different data sources. Something you may not have seen demonstrated before is connecting in to a database. So I'm actually going to work with an Oracle database. This was something that we have done newly at version 2. So I'm going to bring in some counties. I'm going to bring in some wind data. You see we have spatial data, but this is the native Oracle spatial type. So we're bringing in this data. I can map the US counties. And did you see how quickly that drew? So that's 3,000 counties that we're drawing just like that from working in the Oracle database. I'm going to drag across my wind and I'm going to aggregate in the number of wind events that we have. Now you're going to say, okay, this is taking a little bit of time. We've got 30,000 records, is it 300,000 records of wind? We're aggregating them into 3,000 US counties. This is pretty quick, she says opti optimistically. <laughs> this is a live there data set using Oracle 12C. There you go. And just to prove it, 3,000 counties, 300,000 wind events that we've done. So that's working against the native Oracle database. Pretty fast performance that we can get doing that. So let's work with SQL data. So this is connecting live into the SQL server. 
So I have data on wildlife strikes that have occurred across the US, and we're going to have a little explore of this data, see what we've got, and see what we can do to analyze it. So let's take the year. I'm going to drag this across to a chart card. And now we can see, just by dragging across year, that we've got the number of strikes are increasing year on year. Now, some of this may be the amount of data collection. I mean, I know it is. They've improved the data collection. Some of it in the latter years may be that the number of strikes against airplanes is actually increasing. So these are primarily birds that have hit airplanes when, they, when they're around. So let's answer a little more questions as to what they hit, when. So I'm going to take the airport. I'm going to drag that across to a table. Now immediately, I'm doing the count of the number of strikes that have occurred at each one of those airports. I can now see I'm working with 178,000 records. We know they're increasing over time. So I've looked at it by airport. Where exactly are these actually happening, these strikes? So I'm going to drag across the phase of flight into a chart. And now we can see that most of these events are actually occurring on approach, takeoff, landing, descent. So they're occurring at or near the airport. So that's giving me a lot of information already. I've got the height and the speed that the airplane was doing. I'm going to look at that on a chart. So some of these airplanes were clearly pretty much stationary. Some of them were very high. So the data stretches a very wide range there. I'm not really seeing everything in that. What I can do to better see that is I could log my axis. So I'm actually going to do a log log. Now I can see the distribution of that data a lot better. So I'm looking at the relationship between speed and height. I can color that by another variable. So I could color that by, let's do it by the phase of flight. And now I can start to interact between these so I can pick out those when they were landing, what speed and height they were doing, those when they were en route, what's going on. And of course, I'm seeing that also reported on my table. I notice you're not doing anything on a map yet. <laughs> I'm not doing anything on a map because we can see if I scroll up to the start of this, this is just a, a table of data. So this is just tabular data I have in my SQL Server. I have nothing spatial on it. So we're exposing each the type of data it is, numeric, categorical. We have a time field down there, but nothing spatial in it. So I'm just going through understanding this data to see what I can actually do. But one thing I can do, having identified that most of these are occurring at or near an airport, and I know I have the airport in that data set, I can actually now link that to my airports to make this data spatial. So I'm going to go into my create relationships. I'm going to take those airports. I'm going to take those strike reports. It's going to find the, the first ID that's in common. That happens to be the only thing that these two data sets have in common. So that's my option. And now I will have a new data set that appears that's exactly my strike reports. But now I have a shape column on that. So now I can start to map that data. Yeah. Can you show how you got the relationship again? Sure. So up here, there's the relationship view. You click on there. This gives us the option to see it. For one second, I look away. <laughs> of course. I'm going to try and keep that up. <laughs> it is keep that, that simple. Pace up. <laughs> but I, I want to emphasize, don't underestimate the power of simple. There's a lot of things happening behind the scenes that literally takes the technology and fades it away into the background, allowing you to perform the analysis without stressing on the tech getting in the way. So one thing we're seeing here is we're seeing those airport locations. That's the information that I've joined to it, the number of strike reports. But we also know that from this table, we have multiple strikes at every single airport. So this map simply showing me location. I can go into the legend there, change that type, to something that's been automatically calculated for us, and that's the count of each one of those strikes that has occurred at every airport. 
So that's a freebie we've thrown in there to give you that count as we did that join behind using the SQL Server. So do we want to go through these things a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Okay, so. Let's break this down so that everyone kind of understands what's happening. Histograms. I yeah. need to back that up then. Yes, you do. You so, started out with all that. Let's go back to the data that I worked with from Oracle. And I hope you're noticing I'm working with data from SQL, working with data from Oracle, all in the same workbook. So we, I aggregated all of those count of severe wind events into my counties. That gives me the count of wind there. I can actually explore that a little bit more, drag it across to a chart, and you'll see that that gives me a histogram. So that's allowing me to understand the distribution of that data, so the distribution of the count of events I have. Now what we see is that this is a po positively skewed histogram. What that's showing us is that we have a few counties that have very large values, so very large numbers of severe winds. How do I know it's skewed? I could overlay the normal distribution, so we actually, instead of talking about this magic bell-shaped curve that you always want for a normal distribution, have a look at it. Does it fit it? We can see whether it's a normal distribution. And more than that, if you need to quantify this to anyone else or you're doing further statistics, we do the skewness and the kurtosis that will tell you whether that data is normally distributed. So we're allowing you to understand the data and we just and describe the data to someone else. So this is looking at the distribution of wind overall within that data. What if I actually want to look at it by a different variable? So I can change that to a box plot. Again, that's showing us the distribution of the count of wind events. But with a box plot, I can actually group that by a categorical variable. So let's drag this out a bit. So I've done that by state, and now you can see we can click on any part of this, the mouse is just locked up, any part of this box plot, and we can pull out that information. So for example, if you're interested in outliers, you can click on the outliers and it will pull that out. Then you could work with all the outliers in your data if that's what you're interested in. So we're doing a little bit of statistics here, and you can use those values, and you can see with a lot of different categories here, we can start to understand a lot of information all at once. So you did a pretty good job of um, explaining histograms and mm -hmm. box plots. Can you, is there anything else you wanted to elaborate on with the purpose to a box plot and histogram and the analysis that you're doing? Okay. Uh, all right, let's have a look what I've forgotten. So, yeah, the key thing with the histograms is we're actually aggregating that data into the different bins. We're doing using the Sturgis formula to decide how many of those uh, bins you can that are used by default. You can, of course, change that to a different number of bins if you want. And when we're actually calculating the statistics that you're seeing on the front, the statistics that we're doing are actually using that grouped data, that binned data. It won't make any difference to the results that you get if you have a large data set. If you have a data set with not many values, you would notice a difference there. In box plots? In the box plots, I think I've already talked through all of that, how you can compare across a different data set. So let's switch to the analysis we did here. So the bar graphs here, they're very useful for comparing um, broad distributions, you're getting the highs and lows that I can see in the bar graph very easily. They break down if you have too many categories. So then the bars will get smaller and smaller, and although you can change the size of the cards, there's going to be a point at which you lose that information. So that's when bar graphs break down. They are the default for any categorical variable that we want to put on a chart, so you will get a bar graph as the first thing. Yeah? So we're actually working within enterprise. We're not working on, in online. So you're on your own portal. There are no credits at all. Yeah, the initial release of Insights was on-premises as opposed to online first. Um, as we'll talk about that whole thing back in the uh, roadmap. Gives you more details. 
those scatter plots that I showed are allowing you to look at relationship between two numeric variables. Uh, you can also add on the statistics, so we include the statistics here so you can quantify any relationship. We have linear, exponential, polynomial. The, uh, the thing to watch out on when you're doing scatter plots is you should expect some kind of relationship. There should be a reason why you're looking for that. You can make all sorts of relationships between crazy things, you know, the amount of chocolate you eat and how many times you go to bed or something. I mean, it makes no sense. So you should be expecting there to be either a good or a poor or exploring the relationship before you use a scatter plot. Okay. So let's move on with the analysis. We've joined our data together. I'm going to go in and we're going to look at the patterns that we can now create. So I've taken that count of strikes that we have that we've just created joining my strike reports to my airports. And then what I've done here is I've actually created a density surface of every one of those events. To run an analysis tool, we have the action button in the bottom right corner. You can get to the spatial tools, you can do a density, and of course in this case we'd be wanting to do it on the count of strikes rather than just the individual points because we want to take into account the number at each location. Now this is allowing me to see within this map where we have more concentrations of strikes against um, airplanes. We're seeing in Denver we have a lot, in Florida let's say not so many. I then pulled out on this card, so I've done a filter specifically on this card rather than on the actual data set, I filtered out for where we have strikes that are damaging. So the number of strikes which cause some damage to the airplane rather than just the total number of strikes. Now we see between those two locations I've pulled out of, let's say, Denver and Florida, that there's not so many damaging strikes in Denver, but go down to Florida, the strikes that they have are very damaging. So there's something going on here spatially. We already knew at the start of this analysis that different places may collect their data differently, so I may have some spatial problems with the collection of the data, but now we're seeing a, spatial, a clear spatial difference here. We want to try and understand what's going on. So I want to go down and in my data I have something on the size of the birds. Now we've already saw scatter plots, how we can look at relationships, but my size has been collected as a categorical variable, so I can't look at it on a scatter plot. But I want to look at that size by each of my regions. Let me find my regions. Let's do it by district. And what I can do is create a chord diagram. Now in that, we now have the size, which is small, medium, and large. And let's have a look at those two airport regions that I pulled out, so Denver. And now we see in Denver we have six and a half thousand small birds, and if I can hit this line, 500 large birds. In Orlando, we have 6,000 small birds, but one and a half thousand large birds. That's now explained that difference as to why they're more damaging strikes down in Florida. They're large birds, they're causing the damage. So even though it was categories, we could actually go in, use that chord diagram to explore that. Do you want to carry on? So in terms of chord diagrams, they start to break down again if you have too many categories. You can already see this is pretty busy. You have the advantage that you can pull out information by the arc or by the chord, but still, too many categories gets very hard to understand. So you can filter things out to make it a little bit easier to read. So we've explored the number of events we've had, but of course we're talking about aeroplanes striking birds. The more takeoff and landing there is, the more chance there is of a bird being struck. So we really need to take that into account when we're doing our analysis. So let's take our strike reports. We saw how they were increasing over time. So let's look at the, a column chart of that. I'm also going to take 
the operations, now the operations are the total number and takeoff of landings. I'm going to put that across onto the same chart. There's a couple of years in which they weren't collecting the data on the same years. But we can now see that the total operations, that's takeoff and landings, has decreased over time, whereas the number of strikes has increased over time. So now we're able to compare between these two data sets over time to see if there's a difference. So now we know we need to take this into account in some way in our analysis. So I want to combine in this new information that I have on the total number of operations. So this is where we get a little bit clever with our summary tables. So I'm going to take my strike reports. I'm going to look at it by year. I'm going to look at it by airport ID. And I'm going to create a table. So now I have the total number of strikes broken down by airport ID and by each one of my years. I'm going to do pretty much the same thing for my operations. I'm going to take the year. I'm going to take the total operations. And I'm going to take the airport ID. And I'm going to create a table there. So now you see we've got pretty similar tables there. So what I'm going to do is go back into the Create Relationships. I'm going to join those two on Airport ID. But it's important to me that I'm doing this analysis by space and time. That's what I'm investigating. So I can edit this relationship. I can go in and I can change this so that they're also matched on year. So each one of these records is matched on the airport ID, on the location, and they're matched on the year in which they occurred. That's now given me a new table in which I have the year, the airport ID, the count of the strikes, and the total. I have no spatial. I'm back to just working with tabular data. But I can easily go back into that, take that data that I've just created, join it to my airports, and now I should be able to map, actually, let's move that down a bit more, map the count of those strikes. Come on. Gives me a little time for some housekeeping. And the count of the total operations. Wait a minute. I blinked. Oh, did you? Yeah. Can you do that again, please? <laughs> Which one? The... Create the join using the three tables. Create the join. Let me just do it with a different data set so yep. we can see. So we take my two cards. I can go in and I can add in another join here. So this is where I did it with year and year. Mm -hmm. There you go. Let's cancel that. Gosh, it's still drawing. And just to clarify that, can we done the cost to per data sources? Do you want to take that? Yeah, so the question was, can I go across different data sources? Different data um, sets within the same data source can be joined together. We still don't go across. That's a pre-processed event. So if you have two different databases, a SQL Server and an Oracle, and you want to join a table from SQL and then another from Oracle, that is something we do not support yet. Um, that would be a pre-process kind of a thing through an ETL style event or whatever you want to do, or um, pick the technology of choice on that one. That's, that's where we actually draw the line. We don't go across databases yet. This is yeah. just messing with me. Yep. So, um, may I ask you to delete those two cards yes. and that data set and just recreate the view all at one big time? Oh, no. Nope, that wouldn't work. But I can join the one back in again so I could take the airports, join it back in that way. Okay. It's 
trying so hard. What's the next thing I want to do? I can go on with the next step. So what I can do on this data set is I can view my data table. So we've seen a little bit about the summary tables there, how I've used those as kind of to pivot my data. I can also see my data table, which is the same as your attribute table, and I can do a calculation on that. So what I want to do is actually calculate the rate here. So this is going to be the strike rate, and I want to take, remember what these are called, the count of the strikes, I want to divide that by the total number of operations that have occurred. And I'm just going to do it by 10,000 just to make it a rate we can read. That is going to create a new field. So you see this has given us a new field that's calculated the rate of events. So that's taking into account the number of takeoff and landings at each one of those locations. So now, I should at least be able to map that rate, if that one's going to play with me. <laughs> there you go. Spin up. So now you can see the rate. I don't want the sum of the rate. I actually want the average. So that's now giving me the average rate at each location. So that's now enabled me to take into account the fact that there will be, let's say, more takeoff and landings at the larger airports than we would see at the smaller airports. So we now might want to look at that changing rate by space and time because we're seeing this overall, but you remember I joined the, my data together by year, by location. So let's take the districts, let's click on that. Let's take the rate and let's take the year. And what I'm gonna do is create a heat chart. I'm just gonna change that to average. So now you can see in this, how that's increased or changed over time. And we're seeing this spatially. So now we're seeing each one of these locations, what's actually occurred. So we're seeing, let's, let's take Honolulu district, the things were actually a lot worse historically. Even though we saw overall things are getting better, we're now able to break down this information and see where for example, in Memphis, we're seeing that things are actually getting worse over time. So now we're essentially looking at this spatially and temporally. We have a link back to our map to see where locations are, but we're able to clearly see this information in the table. If we want to look at something like the strike reports by airports, let me think. We want to see the number of strikes that have occurred by month, for example. So the birds will be traveling, they'll be migrating. So we would expect there to be some kind of, of temporal change here. So that we could look at on a data clock, which has disappeared way down there. Let me flip that round so we have the months on the outside. So now you can see by the months of the year as we go around this, in each one of these regions, so now we can see the names of the regions as I make that bigger, we can start to see that seasonal migration. So different locations will have to put in measurement strategies at different times of the year. And that's exactly what you'd expect. You know, there's a clear east-west divide within this data as the birds migrate. But you can see how we can start to do spatial temporal analysis. We're always linked back to the locations, but the charts are helping us to understand that. So the summary tables are a very valuable feature. You can break them down by one category, two categories. Whichever thing you drag across, it will be dynamically calculating that information in the background for you. And remember, you can use those data, that 
that form of pivoting your data, essentially managing your data to get it into a new format, and then join it back to the other data to carry on your analysis. So we also went through the data table. You saw how we use the data table that you can um, look at, use lots of functions within there. We have 10 numeric, 10 string, four date, and the three logical of and, if, and or. So you can do all sorts of different calculations within there. Okay. Heat charts I've been through. The one thing to watch out with the heat charts is remember the data is classified. So we're using classifications in each of the bins. So the why I'm saying watch out for it is if you have data that is spread across a wide range, you might have one category that's kind of dominating that chart. Filter it out, then you will see more variation within the other ones. So just think a little bit about how your data sits when you're using classifications. Same things will go for the data clock. So at the very start, we looked at the wind. So we could then investigate whether the impact of wind was having any impact on these strikes. And you will see that just as a broad, this is the average wind speed, speed. We see no relationship at this stage. So you would have to do a lot more analysis for that. Another thing we can do is we can connect into R in the database. So I could- oh, Wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, we, we can work with R in a database? We can. So it sits within the SQL database. So let me find an R function that we have sitting in there. And this is what's exposed. So this is, this is a regression model. We built this regression model on one year. And now you'll see this model is running using R. So this is a function we have. It now ran that model, and now we've done a very crude regression analysis because we didn't use a lot of variables, but we built it on 2008, and you see now we've been, been able to predict what we would expect. The, the, so this is the actual um, count of strikes, and this is what we predicted it to be. So you can run our models in your database. Pretty cool. And just for fun, just in case I was a little bit careful about whether I was talking about wildlife strikes, bird strikes, they're not all birds. You wouldn't believe the things that run out and hit aeroplanes. <laughs> so white-tailed deer, look at that. Real East Coast slant there. Crazy coyotes. We even have a whole load of dogs. So there's domestic dogs seem to like to run out in front of aeroplanes. Rabbits, skunks. I digress. Yes, you do. <laughs> but these were a series of questions that were literally asked by the USDA APHIS of Esri. Can you do it? And of course, we can do an RTS desktop. We can do almost anything you want in RTS desktop. But now you can also do it in insights using a drag and drop experience. More importantly, that same workflow has been recorded behind the scenes, as you can see here through the analysis model and view on every page the model has been recorded. Here's an interesting fact that a lot of people don't realize they can do. If they've created a model, or two, or three, they can bring all three onto a same page and execute three models all one big time to generate the results then that may eventually be interrelated. That's actually a, a really interesting point. Just like when we create these result layers or temporary data sets, they're new pieces of information that were not a part of your original data set. They weren't. But Insights enables you access to that result layer such that you can create new information products to take your, your insight, your insights, <laughs> your analysis <laughs> even further. And that's, that's a critical component to everything. Data is everything to your analysis. And the fact that you can now take a given result, which typically is not revealed to you, and now use that to create even further results, that's a huge step forward in, in working with data. So um, with that said, let's hold on, let me get there. Uh, quick, there quick. we go, I'm there. Sorry, I have a question on, on the heat map. 
mentioned something about the data range is actually too wide. I'm just saying if, if your data is, because yeah. what it's doing is it's classifying the data, it's counting the frequency, it's classifying that data, and then it's coloring each of the cells based on the classification scheme. So if you have some that dominate, you're not going to see as much variation. That, that makes sense. How yep. can we see where the base of is? Well, yeah. So you would, you would see it by the fact that you would have one dominating, then you filter that area out. So if I actually filtered out the example I showed you with Honolulu, if I at, filtered out Honolulu, that takes it out of the data range and then the other ones would be classified differently. So the results aren't over once you see it on a chart. That just says, hey, wait a minute, there's, there might be more there. And the, the power that's behind insights that we're trying to, to uh, tell you guys about is it doesn't stop with the visualization. The visualization may lead to another question, may lead to another answer. That's an important fact. So, yes? Yeah, so the question was, what about the customization features? If I'm a partner, I want to do this for a client, is there anything I can do to enhance the look and feel, maybe some other factors in there? Not yet. Mm. We're working towards that. Right now, there's, there's only what's available and in, in what you see right there. And, um, obviously, you can take the results, put them in a story map, and do with, do with it what you want. But um, that's something that we'll talk about in the roadhead. Okay. So, uh, real quick, and then we got to jump in. The question is, can you create new types of charts that don't already exist? And that too is not yet, but that is definitely coming. So the whole point of extensibility I'll touch on in just a little bit as part of the road ahead. Fair enough? But yeah, that's a common question for us. Um, let's jump in. How does this whole thing work on behind the scenes, and how do I get this running inside my my facility, my organization, my company, whichever word you choose. The only time I'll ever talk about business requirements is this slide. Um, we're gonna focus on the technology more so than the business side of it. However, it is a level two user plus a premium cost in order to get the license for insights. All right? It is based on on-premises ArcGIS Enterprise 10.5, and that is the key to everything that we do with insights. Insights is a separate install that lays down additional bits and we'll talk about that in just a second. So again, level two user plus an insights license to create workbooks. Any named user to be able to view the results of your work. So anyone can actually interact with the results, see how you created those results, and um, you can share it across. The ArcGIS Enterprise software components, we've gotten this question quite a bit because the terminology changed recently, right? It used to be advanced server and all this other stuff. ArcGIS Enterprise consists of these components, the web adapter, the portal, the GIS server, and the hosted data store. That is the minimum requirement for working with insights, okay? So on top of this, we overlay insights. The installation is pretty straightforward. It does not change from what you already know with ArcGIS Enterprise. If you have a distributed install or a single machine install or in the cloud install, that doesn't change. The differences are you're adding more data-driven and data-intensive technology on top of that, insights. So the only caveat is it might affect your sizing and hardware requirements going into it. All right. Once you get all that working and you configure it properly, only then install insights. That's a key to everything. If you can't create a feature layer in, in the data store, you can't share your portal item, you can install insights all you want. It's not going to work right unless the ArcGIS Enterprise works right. We live inside that framework, that platform. So keep that in mind. We constantly get calls on, hey, insights doesn't work. Well, can you create a feature layer outside of insights? The answer is no. Then you've got to go back to, to the drawing board, go back to the enterprise and set it up. That's the key. Just make sure everything is configured properly within enterprise and then lay down insights. It'll just work. So just remember that process right there. Linda showed connecting directly to Oracle, directly to SQL Server. Well, we can connect to all these databases, Oracle 12C, SQL Server. Um, we can even connect to SQL Azure directly from 
uh, insights. We can connect to um, SAP HANA. How many folks use HANA? We got one HANA user, excellent. So we know who's got the money. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Um, and of course, um, Teradata. Any Teradata users in the audience? We got a few. Okay, well we directly connect to Teradata and can make use of Teradata directly. I assume you guys are in the retail industry? A couple of nods? Finance. Yeah, finance, okay. Finance and retail are generally Teradata lovers for some reason, I don't know why, but okay. We work with it, and everything that we did with Oracle and SQL Server is exactly that, because when we bring in these data tables and or views, spatial or non-spatial, it doesn't matter, we treat them all the same way, a data set. But the way to access them is first go to ArcGIS Enterprise, configure your JDBC driver. Once they're configured in Enterprise, we'll know about them through insights and we can make use of those. And then we'll connect directly to the database. There's no middleman in between. There's no ARC objects involved. There's no geoprocessing involved. It's straight from insights to the database. Sorry if I missed it. What about the address? Amazon Web Services? Yeah, like Brexit. I'm sorry? Brexit. Not yet, but hold that thought. Remember what you just said. Insights itself is not just a heavyweight client app. In other words, the intelligence is not in the client. It's a full stack app. It's a very lightweight client. As a matter of fact, for the geeks in the room, it is not dojo based app either. It is TypeScript, Angular 4, Bootstrap, and SAS. The intelligence is really on the hosting server itself where we in incorporated two new capabilities. The Insights Application Service, which is more of an orchestration facility, you can think of uh, a conductor of an orchestra. Right? Insights only knows how to work with the Insights Service. It does not talk to anyone else, the web client. And the Insights Service then knows how to take apart that process that gets delivered to it and pass it around to the individual components that need to do the work. So a simple drag and drop operation may in fact include five or six different capabilities behind the scenes. The client doesn't know the details, the services do. So it's a very different way of thinking about it. Again, we're focused on analysis, which requires a different way of thinking. The application is, in, is independent of the intelligence and the data. The intelligence needs to be as close to the data as possible, hence performance. Now, if I'm working with a large set of information, I'm not waiting for days for it. I'm as optimized as I could be, and that's exactly the scenario here. So the Insights Application Service is a pretty much a conductor. The Analytic Data Service, in working with your relational databases, is the brains behind connecting to and working with SAP HANA, SQL Server, Oracle, Teradata, and anything else, including our hosted data store. It knows exactly how to create the specific SQL necessary to work with the data. So you can imagine, um, Microsoft actually ships this analytic data warehouse or this data warehouse application or database. Sorry, <laughs> AdventureWorks database. It's a sample data warehouse app, uh, database that you can install into SQL Server and work with it. It's about 28 million records, uh, completely normalized, and you can work with it. Sending a request to total number of sales for all North American countries. Now you can imagine working with 28 million records, right? Instead of sucking all that data into the application space to process the information, we send down a SQL request, get back three records instead of 28 million. That is the concept that I'm trying to push here. Intelligence as close to the data as possible. So the analytic data service knows how to talk specific languages for HANA, Oracle, and anything else that we do. And of course, the hosted data store has been extended to support a given schema. Again, for the geeks in the room, Every time I create a workbook, behind the scenes I'm adding an entry to the schema. Essentially it's now creating a workspace for me. And everything I add or any temporary anything I need is maintained within that hosted data store. So we're caching everything in the database. So that's what we're doing behind the scenes. Scaling things out, well, just scaling out ArcGIS Enterprise. Add more servers, add more servers. It'll just work because it's just laying down the bits. We are implemented using Java behind the scenes, so we're cross-platform. Everywhere enterprise works, we work as well. So it's a full stack. It's not just a heavyweight client. 
It leverages multiple components behind the scenes. It tries to send as much intelligence to as close to the data as possible for execution and performance. Extensibility. A key thing about um, insights in our team, we don't try to boil the ocean and we crawl before we walk and we walk before we run. We take things easy. We understand the problem first and then we, then we try to address the problem directly. Extensibility is a big ticket item for insights, whether it's extending a new custom visualization type like adding a chart or extending a data, data source with additional capabilities. Either way, it's a big deal. You can imagine right now if I've taken that model and I want to do more advanced stuff, I want to take it into ArcGIS Pro. Well, that's another way to think about extensibility. I start in Insights, I go to Pro, I add more things, but now I want to take what I just did in Pro and I want to add it as a new capability to Insights to extend the reach even further. That's another thing that we're thinking through. So to begin, we started small again. We're crawling still. We wanted to extend the ability to work with any data source out there. As a matter of fact, leveraging currently an open source product that came out of our DC R&D team, Andrew Turner and Daniel Felton, Fenton and those folks, um, we're leveraging the Coop server to extend things even further. This enables us to work with things like Google Docs, Salesforce uh, report objects, and oh yeah, NoSQL databases. As a matter of fact, a partner of ours uh, I'm not sure if you've heard about them, uh, Mark Logic. They have a great data system that knows how to combine um, structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data all in one place. At our National Security Summit, we worked with them to create a provider for insights that enabled us to work with global terrorism data and the GDELT event data, which is all about media reports, documentation, no structure to it whatsoever. We combined both of those things together using this model plugged it into Insights, and we can do even more than anything you saw today. So we're starting simple with extensibility and Insights. Right now it's about data sources and the ability to pass through the execution logic to those new data engines that are coming through for, from which Insights can orchestrate through its Insights service. So this is where we're starting. We're taking it the next step um, by evolving it into um, more capabilities you can extend through the inside service, more tooling, more things that the orchestrator and the conductor knows about, and of course, adding visualizations is definitely on our roadmap. It's just a lower priority. So let me ask the audience this question. How important is it for you to add additional chart types? Very important or not as important? Very important. Okay, so there's a few hands. So um, we're going to continue adding more chart types. Believe it or not, behind the scenes on the client, we are using low-level D3 to do most of our charting. So if you see it in D3, you say, hey, I can use that. Like a force direct graph is an example for link analysis. Drop us a line, ideas.arcgis.com, point out insights, dot, uh, insights for ArcGIS, and we'll take a look at that. Feedback is important. Um, on the team, we actually listen, and we're agile enough to adjust as we need. Linda mentioned support for R and demonstrated a regression algorithm, albeit crude, with the number of variables. However, this is how we can do it. A lot of folks um, in the tech industry are saying, hey, wait a minute, R is important, Python is important. How do I take advantage of it in your existing infrastructure without you having to relearn a whole new thing with no SQL databases or anything else? Well, a lot of those players are adding support for R directly in their systems, whether it's Oracle, HANA, SQL Server, etc., And we can take advantage of that directly. So for the R enthusiasts out there, you want to write a really cool R script, go for it. Insights can take advantage of it in real time by simply executing it. The pattern is pretty straightforward. The basic pattern is take your R libraries, create the R script, create a stored procedure directly in the database. Add that stored procedure to a view, add it to Insights. How many folks are into R? This of any interest to you? Yes. Okay. How about Python? Yes. Guess what? You can do the same thing with Python. An easy way to extend it. Again, keep in mind, the closer the logic is to the data, 
the better off you will be in, in performance and time. Okay? So these are the things that we support directly in terms of R and Python, and we're just scratching the surface. We have so much more to go. We'll talk about that in our road ahead. I just wanted to talk about some things to think about. Obviously, we're doing things pretty quick here, right? And someone's saying, okay, well, you probably got some beefy, you know, blade server set up behind the scenes to do all this stuff. Well, honestly, there's no magic bullet to this. All the basics that you take into account in sizing and hardware configuration and, and knowing how many users are hitting this simultaneously and planning, all those things are in, in the mix here. The difference now is it's, it's really data driven, very data intensive. So it's not so much CPU and memory, it's also CPU, memory, and disk. The slower the component, that's gonna be your weakest link. So if you're running on a 5400 RPM drive, you're gonna get that kind of speed out of your database. If you're running on a fast SSD drive, it's gonna zip through. If you create an in-memory column restore in your data engine, well, guess what? Everything's running in memory, so that's even faster. HANA is a prime example of that. Everything's in memory. Everything's in memory. No SQL databases, Elastic, all those other things, they're very, very fast because they actually take advantage of memory. What I'm saying is the performance is going to be based on your weakest link. The more you plan, the more success you will have in terms of getting the most out of your system. Here's a prime example. A lot of people think i7 is an enterprise class CPU. You know, the thing you buy in your desktop or your laptop, you get the i7 quad core and you're golden, right? Well, it's great for a development laptop, but not for an enterprise class computing system. Consider the Xeon processor instead. Again, it's all the things that, all the little details that matter, right? Those details will make the difference between a performance system and one that you just say, hey, Insights isn't that fast, it's, it's lame, it's no good. Well, it's only gonna be as fast as the system you're running it on and the planning that you did to account for the type of analysis you're doing, the size of your data, and of course, the, um, the number of users hitting it simultaneously. All those things matter. Um, so that pretty much covers everything. I, I just really wanna point out one thing here, size of data. Everyone's talking about big data. Have you ever seen little data? I haven't, and I've been in the business for 32 years. Data is big. It's just a matter of structured, semi-structured, or unstructured, right? How you access it, how you make use of it. Those are very important details, right? Just know that tables can be very wide, like 100 columns to a table. Well, that's gonna affect performance as much as the size, the, the height of the table, how many records you have in it. So all those things matter. So understand all those details. With that, we're gonna jump ahead to the road ahead. Yep. Running out of time, are we? Yeah. So uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit, very briefly, about how, how we've been thinking and how, so how we're developing as we go ahead. When you start any kind of analysis, whatever you're doing, spatial, non-spatial, whatever, you need to understand the data. You need to know what you've got. You need to know how good the data is, what you can trust, what's missing, what's in there, what's been coded up correctly, incorrectly. Essentially, you need to be able to describe that data either to yourself or to other people. So that was where we wanted to start. We wanted to put in as many tools and abilities for you to understand and describe that data. As we move forward, we're gonna start introducing a little bit more advanced analysis. So we're gonna start thinking about bringing in inferential statistics, being able to do predictions. So we're talking about things like regression. We've already kind of going that way. You can see when I was talking about normal distribution, that's one of the assumptions of standard regression is that your data is normally distributed. So we're already giving you the ability to understand what's in that data and then maybe we'll be able to use that information as well. So the key principles that we have in terms of that is that we wanted to understand, we want the general analyst to be able to do statistics that's straightforward and easy to understand and easy to explain to other people. But we also want to make sure that this is something that an advanced statistician says, yeah, I'm good with that, it's the right way. 
So that's kind of the mantra that we're following in terms of the statistics that we're putting in. It's also a key part of insights. We've already heard that, that performance is key. So we're finding that balance between making sure that you get your answers quickly, but you get your answers accurately. So some of this may be that we will run a few things behind the scenes. So the longer running processes, we might be doing that kind of thing. But this gives you an idea of where we're going in terms of the statistics and the roadmap in that sense. Did you want to take over? No, you're good. I think I'm, I'm good. Uh, so this brings us. How many folks want this in ArcGIS Online? That's what I thought. Thanks for all the extra work. Yeah. <laughs> no. In all honesty, we are um, focusing right now on everything in online. We're in on-premises. We're at a good place with version 2.0. What we're going to be focusing on going forward is getting everything that you've seen today, with the exception of connecting to external data sources like the relational databases from online, into online, so that the same performance, same features, same functionality. So here's an ultimate question for you. Do you want it any slower than what you've seen? <laughs> I know it's a loaded question, but I'm asking seriously. <laughs> Would you be accepting of anything slower than what you've seen? Thank you. Thank you. That's what we wanted to hear. We need it on We need it on the recording so you can hear it. Um, it's an important point. We, what we're, our plans are to um, try to deliver this by the end of the year. The key thing for us is the same features, functions, and performance that you've seen in on-prem is what we're going to deliver in online. So we're working hard to get there. We'll have a definitive date, whether it's December or March of early next year, as to when this will be, but this is coming. Which leads us back to the question about, does this consume credits, right? We're really looking at revisiting what it means with credits and insights in online. Uh, mostly because a lot of what we do behind the scenes is so much more than, than what you can do with, it, with uh, the analysis tools of Map Viewer today. Right? In the analysis uh, tools of Map Viewer, you have to select the tool and execute it so you know exactly what you're getting into. Behind the scenes and in insights, we're, we might be executing five or six different things to accommodate a simple drag and drop operation. So we have to revisit what it means to do credits. So and it's about exploring your data. Yeah, it that's is. the thing. It's about doing the clicks. That's yeah, what so, we want to encourage. So all those things are being considered right now. There's um, a question. There. There's a question, yeah. sir. So are you looking at a scalable subscription model? Um, we're considering all options on the table right now. Exactly. Um, it's not a simple matter of saying you know credits or no credits. It's everything in between. And what we want to be able to do is make sure that we're um, uh, counting for all the variables, again, crawl, walk, and run. Take it slow. Um, so that's pretty much what we're doing. So um, keep, keep tuned to that. We'll be blogging on things, and as soon as this thing comes out, I'm sure Paul Ross and his team are going to be talking big deal about it because everyone wants it in online because they don't want to deal with enterprise on-premises. Um, so that's where we're going. Oh boy, no, we're not going to give a sneak peek. We're running out of time. We're done with that. Um, surveys, et cetera, et cetera. One thing I'd like to add before we close this out, I know we've got um, just a few minutes here for Q&A, but um, insights when we first started out, we said flat out, we're not going to boil the ocean with, with this thing. We're going to focus on the 80-20. 80% of the world uses 20% of the functionality. Let's start there with this new experience, this new intuitive way of working with analysis Spatial or non-spatial, it doesn't matter. We started that way, and in 2.0, we've increased by a factor of n. I mm -hmm. can't even know. I don't even know how much work we put into that. But there's so much more that we want to be able to do. Your feedback is critically important to us driving forward. Every time we plan a release, we only plan for that given release, and we have a bunch of stuff that's ready to go. But two weeks before, we start thinking about that next release, and we take all the information that's coming from the field, um, our industry teams, our users. We understand what it means, and then we reprioritize, and then we set in stone the next release. So as you begin using this, keep that in mind. If something is like really annoying you, we want to hear about it. If there's something that's just missing in your workflow, we want to know about it. So it might be in our backlog, we just deprioritized it because we didn't think anyone wanted it. So keep all those things in mind as we go forward. 
Our road ahead is dependent on uh, making sure we understand the problem correctly and then implementing it correctly once. We don't want to just deliver something and fix it over time. So all this information comes back to us and that's how we're planning our releases and that's how we're going forward. We have a team of very passionate and dedicated um, engineers, software, subject matter experts, product engineers, spatial data scientists, name it, we've got a bunch of those folks behind the scenes and they're really passionate about making sure we get this right the first time. And we can't do that alone. So anything you guys have, the good, the bad, and the ugly, please bring it to our attention. Ideas.arcgs.com, enter your idea there. We read those things, we keep up on those things. Um, of course, our emails, very easy to figure out who we are. First initial, first name, last name, at esri.com. Please feel free to use it, all right? With that said, Q&A. Um, that gentleman had his hand up first, I'm sorry, please. So support for GeoAnalytics server is there in version 2.0. With the big data file share, you can register it in the big data catalog within ArcGIS Enterprise through GeoAnalytics, and GeoAnalytics server can take advantage of that, and we can work with those layers from there. So yes, there is. Yeah, so there's two parts to that question. One is, um, oh shoot, beta, thank you. <laughs> beta and then users across, so part A, beta. We're considering that right now. We're still in the midst of development, so there's a lot of work going on there. As soon as we get closer to the end of August, we'll have more definitive on a beta for online or not. Um, we're hoping so. We've got to get it right the first time. The second question on the licensing requirements, it's too early to talk about licensing with insights and online and how all that's going to work. So I'd like to defer that until later, but we will blog about it for sure. Okay. Two part question, really. Uh, the first is I'm, I'm definitely sold on this being a, a great exploratory analysis tool. But when you think about the paradigm of a always on monitoring kind of tool, I'd love your perspective on that, like how well it fits the need. And the second part is when you think about a, a dashboard kind of view, which is more a red, yellow, green assessment, okay, these are the KPIs I care about. How is everything doing? I click a button and refresh the data. Like, so it's kind of tied to the question. Yeah. Linda, you want to take this one? No, you can go ahead. <laughs> Fair enough. So in terms of uh, more of a common operating picture scenario, where you've got a real-time monitoring of things, that's not insights right now, okay? I'm sure you can get there from here, and of course we have plans to incorporate some of those capabilities into it, so over time it may. But in the meantime, I'd like to consider the, the, um, um, the dashboard, the operations dashboard for real-time monitoring of events and whatnot. That's a tool that's designed specifically for that use case. Our tool is designed for analysis. It's more of a workbench scenario, as opposed to a dashboarding and reporting scenario or real-time monitoring scenario, okay? So where does that dashboard exist, sorry? So the, the operations okay. dashboard yeah. is another app that Esri provides that allows you to set up a monitoring scenario to that. It's a separate app. It's a separate app. Okay. Ours is specifically focused on, on analysis. In terms of creating dashboards and reports, yeah, everyone talks about um, the, the second generation of self-service BI and creating a dashboard and then creating a report out of it. There's a now, there's a overlap between that world and, and our world, I get that. What we're trying not to be is yet another dashboard. What we want to do is, is continue to emphasize the science and allow you to perform the analysis leveraging that science without the technology independent of the dashboard or report. With that said, um, I've got this common phrase that I, that I sold Jack on. Data is important, but not as important as the answers it provides or the stories that it tells. Answers, that's the analysis workflow, and that's what our priority has been, making sure we get that right. The second part, telling the story, we started down that path, but we've got a little more to go. Right now it's about sharing, and you can share a page, you can embed a page in a story map, but we know that there's a larger picture there and we haven't come there yet. I call that the presentation. Right? How do I present my, re my results? And that's going to be a longer term project. We're gonna be starting on that in the second half of this year. Fair enough? Okay. There's a question at the back there. In the back over there? Is 
So at the moment, the, all the information when we create any of those cards, what we're doing is we, we will probably be slightly changing the data. I mean, if you take something like a bar graph, then we've aggregated the data up by category. Every time we do that kind of thing, so all of these uh, visualizations, you'll see, let me scroll up here, are actually creating a new data set. So every single time we're doing that, we're giving you a data set. When it first comes out, it sits within the workbook, so it's just there. It's just a kind of temporary view. But what you can do is share that data. You're sharing it back to your portal, and then you have that new data set that you've created as part of that. Yeah. Cool. Let's jump right over here. Do you have access to some of the other um, Esri data, living Atlas data, other kinds of data that um, Esri provides? Do you access that data for demographics and resources? That's something that, you, that I haven't seen you guys um, integrate yet. Yep, so the yes. Living Atlas, you can add in the data just there. If you want to do the enrichment, so adding in the demographics, so this, this one's not hooked up to it, but yeah, you can. We So we have the enriched data tool, so that will go straight to that demographic variables and add them all in. Yep. yep that's just what we have to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, right. we talked about that in the intro session, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> Sir. So the, the question was on joins, and can you clarify how you do the joins? Essentially what we're saying is within the same Oracle database instance, you can do joins across tables. What we're not doing so far is across an Oracle database to a SQL Server database. We're not doing that. That's a pre-processing step. If you want to enable that, that's a pre-processing step. Please do. Um, but for us right now, and we're considering things like uh, like the uh, open source project Triad. Are you familiar with Triad? Yeah, okay. It's It basically allows a provider model and caches everything and then does everything on the fly um, across data providers. We're looking at stuff like that. We're still researching it, but right now that's not on the roadmap as a priority compared to a lot of other things that we need to do. There. And to be clear on how we do joins if we bring in Excel data, so if you want to join Excel and you want to join it to a feature layer, we actually copy our data, the data over from Excel into the hosted data store, so you will be able to join across those. That's a fairly yeah. common join case. Yes, ma'am. Do you support access database? Ah, I knew that was coming. <laughs> Inevitably, I get the access question. I know it's a very popular database because it's small, it's simple, and it does what you need for a departmental size thing. Um, mm -hmm. Using that extensibility model, we can bring access data in. So there is a way forward there. However, um, out of the box, we don't support it yet. We haven't had a lot of um, requests outside of onesie, twosie kinds of people asking for it. In general, people export that out and then put it into a larger database, and that's what they serve out to a multi-user system. Or into Excel. Um, but um, you happen to have tipped the scale on that priority, so that changes the subject, and we'll be talking about that going forward. So we listen. We actually listen. Yes, sir. Uh, licensing. So I have an on-premises portal but to the user that I need insights. Yeah, so this is a licensing question. I love these questions. Um, <laughs> I'm right. on the R&D side, not on the sales side. So, But it is a level two license minimum, and then you have to purchase a premium license on top of that. Now, as I understand it, if you have an ELA, for every thousand dollars you spend, you get a free license with it. So I recommend you talk to your account manager to see where things fit and, and what you can do. Keep in mind, everything's negotiable. Um, this gentleman right here. If, if, if you have to do Microsoft BI, what is the tool? Let's say Insight is What I'm seeing is if it's doing something that's you know, very similar to what BI is doing, and it's already in the cloud, so to speak. Yeah, this is a very common question. The question is, how is this different than BI? It's really what it comes down to. Power BI does things. Insights is doing those kinds of things. What gives? There is overlap, but let's also call a spade a spade. Spatial is the difference. We're about spatial analysis. We're not actually extending Power BI with all the power that exists within Insights around spatial analysis. 
how we deal with spatial is special. It's got a round world, flatten it out, different projection systems. It's not just WGS84 or 102, 100. It's a bunch of things. Go to Great Britain with a uh, world uh, web Mercator map and say, okay, here you go. It doesn't work. So coordinate systems, understanding analysis against those origin coordinate systems is what we do. Right? Big difference compared to that. And yeah, let's call it what it is. GIS has always done the same types of analysis as all those other players. We just don't emphasize it. We emphasize the spatial. Queries, filters, aggregations, and joins, we've always done it with numbers, strings, and, and temporal data. We now can do it with spatial on top of that. So it's, it's a GIS thing, and there's going to be overlap, and we can't avoid that. As a matter of fact, the Power BI team, the Master Power BI visual that you've probably heard about, that's also my team. I'm the one that brought that to Esri, right? So I, I understand what you're saying, but I do know that Microsoft has a space. We have our space, and there's some overlap in between, and we can't do anything about that. My recommendation is use the right tool for the right job. I always go back to the analogy of the carpenter. You have a woodshed full of tools. Not everything's a hammer, not everything's a nail. You gotta pick the right tool for the right job and go with it. Insights is, is emphasizing spatial analysis, but keep in mind, analysis is analysis. And the speed of thought style analysis based on the fluid motion of your thought process is what we're trying to achieve with insights. You can sure start over here and then go somewhere else and do something else, but now your thoughts are distracted and you gotta regain your focus. What we're trying to do is give you everything you need to perform your analysis with an understanding that spatial is the emphasis. If location matters, insights is where you need to be. That's, that's kind of our, our thinking, but it's up to you. Pick the right tool, because they're all good. They really are. Hope that helps. Um, one last question, we gotta call it because we got another session coming in the room. Sir. Uh, are you thinking about doing this as a group versus one off, one person at a time? Um, are we thinking about doing this as a group instead of one-off? What one do you off? mean? Collaborate group. I'm not sure, so sure I understand the question. Yep, we'll talk to you. All right, we'll talk about it offline. Thank you all very much. Appreciate your time.